requirements for water surface profile calculations in HC RAS. And so by the end of this presentation, hopefully you have an understanding for how you represent data, uh, why you want to represent the data, and where you need to represent geometric data. We're going to start off by talking about study limits. It's important to understand that when we put together a hydraulics model, we're not just putting together the hydraulics model for the area of interest. That area of interest is going to impact things upstream, <coughs> and you need to have a downstream boundary condition set far enough downstream that if you've made a mistake in establishing that downstream boundary, that it's able to um, correct itself by the time you get to the area of interest. Um, and then we're going to talk about the two main um, pieces of geometric information that you use to create a steady flow model, and that'll be the river schematic, and then the cross-section and the cross-section property. Okay, so steady limit determination. If you're putting together a steady flow model, the first thing you need to think about is what is the area of influence of my model? Um, so if you're putting in, in this case, we have a, a diagram of a levied area, where we've got a, a steady reach, um, and we're we're doing a levy raising or we're, we're putting in a levy. We're not just going to put in a hydraulics model to evaluate the profile at that, that project location, but we need to extend our model downstream so that we can establish a boundary condition from which we're gonna start doing our standard step uh, backwater computation. And then we need to additionally add a portion to our hydraulics model to evaluate upstream of that project um, to see the effects of that project on anything upstream, okay? So when we talk about a study, we're not talking about just the localized area, we're, we're looking at it holistically, okay? And so we'll have our existing conditions profile and then we'll have our modified profile or our with project condition profile. And <clears throat> as you can see, we have two options here. We can start with uh, a boundary condition that might be too low or we can start with a boundary condition that might be too high, but eventually you'll see that both profiles reach the same water surface elevation at the downstream end of our project. So we can uh, effectively evaluate the effects of that project on the water surface profile. So the question you're asking is, well, how do I determine if I've started my downstream boundary condition far enough downstream? Or have I extended my model far enough upstream so that I can properly uh, evaluate the effects upstream? So how would you do that? Are you going to get out your calculator and do it? Are you going to do it with RAS? Are you going to ask your colleague? How would you guys evaluate whether or not you started your downstream, uh, your, your model downstream far enough to evaluate the boundary condition? Who's got an idea for me? Sure, Rebby. Um, like, do a sensitivity check. Perfect. So you're always going to want to do, whenever you're doing modeling, you're always going to do, want to do what we call sensitivity analysis. You're going to want to evaluate the model given uh, differing boundary conditions. Okay, so in this case, maybe I set my downstream boundary at 10 foot stage, 11 foot stage, 12 foot, 13, 14, and so on run all those different profiles and see how that affects my model. If they all come together and they all give you a similar answer right around here, then that means great, you've extended your downstream boundary far enough and it doesn't really matter what your downstream boundary is, your uh, model will be starting off with a good answer at the, the project. Yeah, Ken. So isn't that, I mean, I assume that you have to go out and collect all your geometry data first, right? But yes. When you, when you don't have the data and you yeah, don't know how far? That's a great question. So how do we figure out how far downstream we might need to collect data? Right? Typically we write that up front in our, in our scoping. We have to go collect data. Well, uh, HCC has published a document, I can't remember, I think it's RD26, um, which um, is titled Water Service Profile Accuracy Study. Um, it's available on our webpage. You can use that for reference and there's uh, some regression analysis was done after performing uh, like 100 or 1,000 runs to figure out what, the downstream, what a good downstream distance should be. And what we find is that a good downstream distance can be determined based on the hydraulic depth uh, for the 1% event or for a larger event. 
and the slope of your river system. Okay? So here's an equation to help you estimate about how far downstream you need to go to start your project. So it says the length downstream of my project area needs to be approximately 8,000 times the hydraulic depth to 0.8 divided by the slope, and that slope is in feet per mile. Okay. So what does that work out to be? For most river systems, that works out to be about a mile, mile and a half to two miles downstream of your, your project area. So let's ask a little a generic question. So if you have a very steep river as compo uh, compared with a mildly sloped river, do you need to start that boundary condition farther downstream? Or can it be closer to your project area for a steeper river? So a steeper river, slope's going to be higher, right? Which is going to reduce the distance we need to go downstream. So a steeper river, your boundary condition is going to work back to an appropriate water surface elevation more quickly. Okay. Likewise, there's a similar equation for trying to predict how far upstream uh, your project might induce the water surface profile. It's got a head loss equation in there. It wants to know how much head loss you might have uh, for this case, like going through a bridge. Um, but again, it's based on hydraulic depth and slope of the river system. Okay, so if we look back at this picture, what is this showing us? It's showing us that the way we're going to solve the equations in RAS for steady flow, uh, we're going to use a standard step uh, solution that uses the energy equation. And we're going to find out, we're going to talk more about that in a, a following presentation an upcoming presentation. But what we see here where this profile ends up getting back to the right answer, eventually we call that a self-correcting. So the equation is actually self-correcting, <coughs> the equations that we use. And so let's look at how that works. So for this class, you need to know three equations. And I'm going to introduce them to you right now, but we'll have a se second presentation where we'll dive more into the, the equations. Um, but in order for you to understand how the energy equation self-corrects, we need to understand how it works. So we'll just hit on that for right now. So this is the energy equation. And when we're doing uh, our standard step backwater analysis, if we're solving from downstream to upstream, so in RAS, the downstream cross-sections always have a smaller number. Okay, so cross-section 1 is always going to be downstream of cross-section 10. And that's... Uh, the new numbering scheme that we're going to use for our cross sections, you'll, you'll learn about this week. That's how we do the math. So smaller cr uh, cross section number, it's lower downstream, and then we do a backwater up to the next, the next cross section. So in this case, we've got one, cross section one, and cross section two, and we're going to solve the energy equation going from that downstream cross section to the upstream cross section. So what are the terms that we're looking at? We're going to look at a datum. We're going to look at water depth. We're going to look at velocity head at both cross sections. And then as we go from one to two, there's going to be some energy loss, and that's going to be captured in this energy loss term. Okay, so that's the first equation you need to know. That's the energy equation. You guys should all feel comfortable with it. Love it. The second equation you're going to need to know is what is that energy loss equation look like? Well, it's going to be based on the distance between my cross sections, that's L, times my friction slope. And this is going to be an average friction slope. So it's going to be the average, um, and it's conveyance, it's a conveyance weighted average. You guys will see that this, uh, this afternoon. So it's an average friction slope between cross section one and cross section two. And then it's going to be based on the difference in velocity head times some coefficient. Okay, and this is either going to be contraction or uh, expansion coefficient, depending on whether uh, the water is accelerating or decelerating. Okay, we'll find that out. Notice it's an absolute value, so it doesn't matter if we get our, our signs right. It's just going to be a, the absolute difference between the two velocity heads. Okay, so those are the first two equations. What's the other equation that you're going to need to know this week? You guys are all river hydraulics people, I hope. There's, there's one. Momentum's a good, a good uh, guess. That's not the one I was looking for. Manning's. Manning's was the one I was looking for. So we also need to know Manning's equation. 
So let's put all these together on the whiteboard. All right, so the first thing we need to know is we're gonna solve head loss. So let's, let's not worry about the datums. So we'll just solve using the water surface. So we'll go uh, water surface at the downstream cross section plus our velocity head plus some head loss. It's going to be equal to the depth of the upstream cross section plus its velocity head. Okay, that's good. That's the first equation. Second equation we need to know is we need to know how we're going to solve for that. So that's going to be the distance between the cross sections times some average friction slope plus a contraction uh, or expansion coefficient times the difference in the velocity heads. Okay. And then the last one we need is Manning's equation. Everybody knows Manning's equation by heart, right? All right. So let's, um, in, I think the best way to, to go through this is let's just pretend we're starting at our boundary condition. So cross section number one is at our boundary condition. And we're going to solve back to cross section two. So if we're starting with our boundary condition, what, what do we know at our boundary? We, we know a stage somehow. Somehow we figured out our stage. Either there's a rating curve, we put in the stage, or we use the normal depth boundary condition, which essentially gives you a stage. So we know what Y1 is. That's known. Well, if y1 is known, can we solve for the uh, velocity head? Yeah, because we're one of our one of the things we input in the model is we know flow. So if we use Manning's equation, we know flow, we know our end values, uh, we know our depth. So using our depth, we can solve for our area and our hydraulic radius. Um, and you, in, in, man, in the, uh, for the normal depth boundary, we gave it our friction slope. So we have everything we need. Okay, so based on that, we can divide this by area and we can get velocity. So we know velocity head. <clears throat> so then if we're solving for the cross section number two, what are we gonna do? Well, in general, we're just going to take our depth and we're gonna apply it upstream and move on. And that's gonna give us some velocity. Okay. So what we're really trying to solve for in this equation is we're really trying to figure out the, the uh, energy, uh, energy loss going back to that next cross section. Well, we know the distance. We, can, we know what V1 is. We'll be approximating what the velocity head is at 2. So really the only thing we don't know is the friction slope. Okay. But again, as we, we talked about, we know the friction slope at the bottom. We can determine what the friction slope is at the top and we'll get an average, okay? So that's, that's how we solve for each of the individual terms. Now the question is, how is this going to help me self-correct so that eventually if I have a bad downstream boundary, how does it work its way back to a good downstream boundary, to the correct water surface? Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's pretend, we don't need to pretend, but here's my river. Um, and this is the answer that I should have, the dotted line, but let's, let's pretend that I guessed a water surface that was too low, okay? I put in, for instance, normal depth that, uh, result, that was too steep, and it resulted in a stage that was too <coughs> low. Well, what does this happen? What, what happens to these equations? So Y1 down here is too low, if Y1 is too low, what does that mean for my, um, my energy, conservation of energy at that, that cross section? What's gonna happen to the velocity? So energy, sorry, I should have written this up here, but so this is the energy equation, right? So for any cross section, my energy is gonna be equal to my water surface depth plus my velocity head for whatever cross-section I'm at. So if 
for a given energy, I guessed a low water surface in order to make up for that energy, because energy is not going to change. I have the same energy um, at the cross section. I'm going to have, have to have a much higher velocity head, right? So if I have a higher velocity head, then there's two different ways that I can go from this starting point over to the upstream cross section. I can, uh, well, I'm going to make it up through energy loss. And the way I can do that is either based on my friction slope or based on the change in velocity head, right? So essentially what we're looking at is for my friction slope, it's going to be an average of the two. And if I have a high velocity here, I'm going to end up having a high uh, friction slope, much higher than what it should have been if I was solving for a water surface right here. Okay? So I'm going to get a high friction slope. So this S, S of F is going to, to go up. So if Y is low, I'm going to have a higher velocity, and I'm also going to have a higher friction slope. So this term will be larger than it should be because I have a higher friction slope. So this term will be larger for a lower water depth. And then the difference here, the velocity here is too high. Let's pretend this velocity ended up being perfect. So the difference between these two is going to be greater than if these answers were more appropriate. So what, that, what happens then, if we go back to this picture, we guessed a low water surface, we got a high friction slope, we created a lot of energy loss between the next cross section, and so our water surface profile is going to creep up onto the correct answer if you start uh, far enough away. Okay. I see some overwhelmed, confused faces. <clears throat> Essentially, think about every cross section as having a energy that cannot be destroyed, and it's going to be comprised of a depth and a velocity head. If ever in RAS, RAS thinks the water surface should be very low, you're going to get a much higher velocity. Okay, and that's where where uh, Stan was introducing uh, the idea of alternate depths. We looked at the specific energy diagram for any water surface profile. For any um, stage and Eric, what's on this axis? Energy. For any given energy, we have two alternate depths. We have our subcritical answer. And we have our supercritical answer. But this energy is comprised of depth, which is one of these guys, and our velocity head. Okay? So that's your crash course introduction to um, how the energy equation will self correct itself from cross section to cross section if you put in a bad water surface. Okay? And so you can test this by doing a sensitivity analysis directly in RAS. So you can set up your river hydraulics model and then you can put in what you, you're going to put in what you think is a really great guess um, for your downstream boundary. But then you can go in and put alternate boundaries in and you can see how long does it take for my water service profile to come um, to the same water surface. Okay, and here you can see this is actually a really steep river system coming into a very flat valley. And you can see it took a long time for the water surface profiles to, to come back together. Um, and it didn't c come back until we had a relatively st steep slope for the river system. We'll work on this river system this afternoon. No, tomorrow afternoon. We're going to put together a model of the Yosemite uh, Valley where you can play with the Merced River and you can start to see some of these effects. Depending on where you guys start and stop your model, you'll see a different effect. Okay, so that's the idea of study limits and the fact that whenever you're doing your model, you need to consider an area 
much, much larger than the area of quote unquote interest. If you're putting in a bridge, you need to start your model downstream, a mile or two downstream, and you need to let that model run maybe a mile upstream to evaluate the impacts, okay? So that's the mundane, figuring out your boundary condition uh, portion of the presentation. The rest of it, we're gonna talk about how do I represent the real world through my river hydraulics model? And in RAS, when we're doing 1D steady flow, there's two uh, main pieces of information we need to be considering. One is my river center line, and the other are my cross sections that are gonna represent the floodplain and other features that are in, in the, uh, the terrain, okay? So the first one is the river network. It's going to establish how water moves through the system and it's going to establish how flow is connected, okay? When we are developing our river schematic, we're always gonna draw it in the direction of flow. So we're gonna be drawing it from upstream to downstream in the direction of flow. And in RAS, we, um, we're gonna have rivers, which when a tributary comes in, it forms what we call a junction. So here we have what we call a two river, three reach system. So here we have one, uh, one river, the Baxter River, and then a second river, the Thule River. And it is, so those two rivers have three reaches. So we have a lower reach, we have an upper reach on the Baxter River, and then we just have the Thule River, which has just a tributary, okay? And it's important that you understand that we have rivers and reaches because that's how your data will be organized in RAS. If you're looking for a particular cross-section, oftentimes you'll have to select the river and then the reach that you're looking for in order to find it. And so when those come together, then we'll form a junction, and the color scheme we use in RAS for a junction is a red dot. All right, so that's our river network. And then to represent um, elevation information, the, tr the land surface, we're gonna represent, represent that with a a what we call a cross section. And a cross section is just gonna be a perpendicular uh, section through the, the, the ground surface. Now, we're representing this very 3D <coughs> terrain in a very 1D object. So while the terrain is going to vary um, radically or erratically, depending on how you want to look at it, we're only going to be able to represent that terrain with a limited number of surveyed points or points that we've extracted um, from the terrain model. Okay, but what are, what are we trying to focus on here? Are we trying to get a, a really good representation of the terrain? Or is there something else that we might be trying to get a good, a good handle on? What is this cross-section trying to represent? The channel? The, the area. The area. I like the area. So we are trying to represent the channel. We do want to be able to capture the entire floodplain. But area, we want to be able to represent the conveyance for any given water surface profile for that section. Okay, so yes, we want to represent the terrain well. And if there are specific objects in the terrain we want to represent, we have other ways to do that. But the cross section's job is to get for various elevations a good representation of what the conveyance is going to be. How much water can move through my system at that one location. <clears throat> Now, where can we get the terrain data? At this point, we're probably all using digital terrain models. Is anybody sending out survey crews? You guys are all relatively young. Most of you guys are relatively young. You're probably not working on a lot of high profile studies. In this day and age, most of the time we're working with digital terrain models of some sort. LIDAR acquired, stereographic imagery, however we acquired them. Um, that's not to say most of the time you'll want to ground truth that data and send somebody out and get a few cross sections at some key locations. What are some key locations that you might want to go out and, and uh, take the afternoon off, tell the boss you're going for a drive? At junctions, junctions of the river. At junctions of the river, you want to see how water is going to come together. 
That's a good location. Bridges. Bridges. Bridges are the number one thing, right? Anywhere there's a constriction in the river, that's going to control flow, probably, probably for several miles upstream. So anywhere there's some sort of flow change location um, or rapid change in the geometry, you want to go out there. So bridges are a great place because they're easy to survey, right? You can drive across the bridge, park the car, take a look, make sure that the terrain that you have in your RAS model matches what's in the field, okay? So we can get it through ground surveys, contour maps, digital elevation models, and now we have the capability to easily extract that information directly from within RAS from a terrain model and get a nice representation of what that land surface looks like. Okay. When we're putting together our cross sections, we always have to be thinking about some rules. Rules to how water moves through life, rules to how HC RAS does its computations from cross section to cross section. So what do we need to think about? <clears throat> We've already addressed this once, but when looking at a cross section, we're always looking at it as if you're going, um, moving in the downstream direction, and we're looking at it from left to right. So we want to acquire the data that way. So the data that we're going to enter is always going to be entered from left to right when looking downstream. We always, always, always want to make sure that our cross section is laid out perpendicular to flow. And that includes the channel and the floodplain. Okay, so every cross section should have at least one cross section out in the leftover bank, one in the uh, main channel bank, one on the other main channel bank, and then one in the right over bank. At a minimum, we want to see four points in every cross section. If you only did one, uh, two points from left to right, then that better be a really, really straight section of the river. We want that cross section to be representative of the channel and floodplain area. And again, we're trying to capture conveyance. Okay. We want to space the cross section so that there's a smooth transition in the floodplain properties. We're going to be solving mathematical equations that are essentially averaging information from one cross section to the next. So that means that the data that we provide the computation engine needs to reflect that. Okay, so make sure that if we're not, if there's not a smooth trans, if there's a smooth transition in the terrain, or if there's, sorry, if there's any transition in the terrain, we want to capture that. We don't want to have a cross section way up stream where the channel is really narrow and then one cross section way downstream where it's really wide. We want to capture that um, expansion through the terrain. And then clearly we want to capture the entire floodplain extent. That's great. I love that Cam has all these rules for me. How am I going to remember them? Um, where am I, where am I, how am I going to capture the fact that that I need to have a smooth transition. Here's, here's an, a secondary set of rules for um, where we want to lay out cross sections. So anywhere there's a change in, in width, we want to capture that smoothly. That makes sense, right? Anywhere there's a change in roughness. So we're going to be computing uh, friction losses. That's this part of the equation, length times friction slope, this, this uh, is used for computing friction losses between the cross sections. So anywhere there's a change in surface roughness where we enter our Manning's end values. Our Manning's end values are what we use to compute those friction losses. If there's a change, we need to gradually capture that. Anywhere there's a change in bed slope. So channel goes from steep to flat, we need to make sure we capture that transition. Bridges and other hydraulic structures, again, those are another way of saying control, control points. In RAS, we have the ability to put in bridges as specific computation nodes. Um, but in order to do that, we need to put in cross sections that bound that, that structure. You guys will find out tomorrow. We'll talk all about bridges in the afternoon. <coughs> you guys will learn how to do that. Uh, any, other, any other control points? If flow goes through critical depth. We need to capture that. Um, the way we enter flow changes in RAS is we have to have a cross section. So if we 
you know, just downstream of a junction, maybe there's some urban runoff that comes into your river system. You need to place a cross section there if you want to have a, ch a flow change location. <clears throat> and then lastly, since we're averaging things between cross sections, we want to have enough cross sections that we can properly do an averaging from one cross section to the next. So that oftentimes means we might need to interpolate or lay out another cross section in between those controlling cross sections. Okay, so this is my version of a Kahoot. We talked about laying out the cross sections perpendicular to flow. So which cross section here was laid out properly? The pink cross section or the green cross section? Okay, and why was the green cross section laid out properly? Perpendicular to the channel and perpendicular in the overbanks. And so if we were to lay out these two cross sections in the same location in these two different ways, where one we put in a detailed cross section and the other we took a non-detailed cross section, the resulting elevation profile for those two cross sections would be dramatically different. Right? So the green cross section, which is correct, that's going to give us one water surface answer versus the cross section in purple, right? So in general, what would we expect the water surface to do if, it, if we laid out our cross, section, cross sections in general, like the purple line, pink line? We would expect the water surface to be lower, right? Because we have more conveyance available. Um, now, depending on the river system and, and exactly how things are working, the energy equation has two depths for any specific energy. So a contracted cross-section like this could actually cause water to accelerate, and we could, it could uh, possibly go through supercritical flow. I would not expect it in a natural river system like this, but um, in general, we would expect the purple, pink cross-section to have a lower water surface. You might not see that, and hopefully this week you'll, you'll see how real rivers work and see that the water surface, it might, it might react where the, the velocity, in order to balance the energy equation, you have to get high velocities, and you might get a supercritical answer. And then you have to go in and decide, is that appropriate for this portion of the river, or do I need to go in and get better geometry data? Okay, um, I've got a real quick <coughs> schematic here just to demonstrate a typical floodplain and how we might want to lay out cross sections. Um, I've got cross sections laid out in, in order. So cross section one is downstream, cross section 14 is upstream. And so here we've just got a few, like a typical model with a typical situation. And so cross section one, we've laid that out. That's our downstream boundary, whatever. I'm gonna ask just a few uh, questions of you guys. Um, we'll get you started. So why do I have cross section 13 laid out there between 14 and 12? These are the things I want you to think about when you're looking at a real train model. This is my fake train model. Is that to ease the transition from the larger river? Yeah, so I wrote this word riffle in here to try and indicate to you guys that there is some change in slopes. Okay, so it's hard to, hard to do in a 2D picture, but this is my other version of a Kahoot. Um, cross sections 10 and 11, why do I have those there? In RAS, in order to model a bridge, we're going to need bounding cross sections around that bridge. Okay, and then cross section nine, we're starting to do some expansion. That's great. Um, we're trying to expand slowly over this transition zone. Cool. Cross section eight is great. What's happening in cross section seven? Right. We've got a contraction, right? So if this is my floodplain in blue. You can see going from cross section eight to cross section seven, we're contracting and cross, sec uh, cross section seven, or maybe six is really what we need to represent that uh, control point with. Okay, then we're going from cross section six, going to cross section five. Why is cross section five in there? Land use. Right, the land use. The, the channel's not really changing based on my cartoon, right? But now I've got some sort of urbanized area. We've got houses, which is different than what I had up here. So we've got cross section five. Um, from five to four looks fairly uniform. What happens at cross section four? We start to expand maybe. 
And then we definitely expand, and we have a land use change at cross section three. We're going from my trees to my, my crop, my row crop, et cetera. We also notice that my cross sections are bent. We call that dog leg. So they're perpendicular to flow in the entire floodplain. Yeah. Did you say cross section isn't changing very much from the five to four? Is four kind of there so that the, the cross section three isn't being averaged over a longer distance? Yes. So the question is, we've got cross section five and we've got cross section three. Why do we have cross section four? Um, and it's because uh, we, we don't want to average properties over a long distance. We also want to have a smooth transition from this land use type to this land use type, right? Otherwise we'd have, maybe my row crop's a 0.04 and these trees are a 0.1, we'd be averaging this friction slope over this distance and we want to change uh, change the the roughness coefficient in the old bank. Depending on the project that you're doing the model for, couldn't you just have a distance between the cross sections that you find uniform? Like every 50 feet, I'm going to have a new cross section. You can you can do that. Uh, the guidelines that we're talking about right now <coughs> are intended for where do you have to have cross sections, okay. not where can you also have cross sections. So I'm try not trying to limit you in where you put them. I'm just trying to remind. R make sure everybody's aware of where we absolutely need to have our cross section. Okay. Question? Yeah, you have a guideline on, um, like for like three to two, like it would be like aspect, ra aspect ratio to length to like changing cross sections. Okay. Is there any kind of guideline? Um, so you obviously do a lot of two dimensional modeling. So you're thinking about aspect ratio. Uh, that's great. We're going to talk about contraction and expansion tomorrow. But flow typically contracts at a ratio of about one to one. So if we're just physically looking at a particle of water out here and maybe it is contracting, we want to make sure that we can capture that contraction in the next cross section. So I, I think of it more of like a one to one ratio because water is going to contract at about a one to one rate. And so if your floodplain, the, the channel is about 100 feet wide any piece of water that's moving, I might want it to be able to get influenced by um, all of the cross section downstream. So I would probably limit my um, spacing to 100 feet, if that makes sense. That, that might be overkill, um, but that's the way I like to think about it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. Why are the bound? Because I was lazy. Oh, this one, this one, this one's dog leg. That one is. I thought flow was relatively uniform. Okay. For the bridge, though. For um, the bridge, though. For the bridge, it's also great. You cannot just two points instead of four points to create that line. Yeah. So uh, water that's approaching the bridge, mm -hmm. it's going to be going over the uh, the bridge perpendicular okay. to the bridge. I did a FEMA flood map like a year and a half ago, and I remember the bridges were straight. They told me just to dog like the other ones, but for the bridges were straight. I didn't know why. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so now this is just my simple cartoon. You guys will run into a lot of real world scenarios where your cross sections won't look like this. But I just wanted to have a, be able to have a discussion with you. Okay. And yeah, as water approaches a bridge, the water is always going to go over the bridge perpendicular to it. Okay. Um, so just a cartoon, just to get you thinking. We're going to have a nice exercise after this where you guys get to think about all this. OK, so where else do we need to have cross sections? <coughs> so whenever you're laying out cross sections, you need to be thinking about, I want to represent the terrain in my 1D world. Okay, And so we've talked about the floodplain, but you also need to think about it in terms of a profile view. And so we have a couple of different <coughs> scenarios where the idea is that you want to have cross sections closer together when the water surface changes more rapidly because you want to capture that rapid change in water surface. So here, um, here we've got a waterfall. So water's going this way. This is high ground. Water's going to go th through uh, critical depth over a waterfall. <clears throat> in order to capture the terrain, we have one set of cross sections. But if we want to capture the water surface as it goes over that structure, we would need to incorporate additional sections. 
So we have the upstream area here. We have the controlling part of the waterfall. It goes through the waterfall. And so these are the main cross sections, these dark solid green lines. And, but then we also have these dotted cross sections that have been added so that we can compute the water surface at more locations. Okay. You're going to need to have more cross sections where you have rapidly varied flow. And this is a rapidly varied flow section. We also have another way to handle this in RAS where you can use a controlling structure. And in RAS, we call that an inline structure. So you can also use that to model the exact same scenario where we're still going to have a good tail water connection and we're still going to get, have a good hail wa uh, sorry, tail water water surface and headwater water surface. But here we, we, aren't wrap, we aren't capturing the water surface over the structure. Okay, so depending on the scenario you're looking for, if you want to have a detailed water surface over the structure, you'll need to use cross sections. If you just want the model to run um, because you're more worried about the floodplain upstream and downstream of the, the structure, you can use what we call an inline structure. Um, and that'll solve for the tail water, and it'll solve for the headwater based on the Weir equation. And then we notice through here, we just have an interpolation of water surfaces from this location up to here. Okay. So this is for an area where you have rapidly varied flow um, and you're just trying and you'd be using inline structure. So we use this a lot in um, unsteady flow modeling um, because this is often a source of model instability. In steady flow, if you need to have accurate water surface results around the structure, you need more cross sections. If all you care about is a generalized water surface, you can use an inline structure. You can model tributaries in RAS in several different ways. We have a crude way of just laying out cross sections for the main river of interest and then running those cross sections up the tributary and blocking those out with an ineffective flow area. That will allow us to compute a relatively decent water surface profile, but rather than our water surface profile being sloped in the direction of flow, it's going to be sloped in the direction of this flow, right? So notice in my main river, I have my cross sections very close together, so I don't get a big change in water surface. That's going to be reflected when I go to do the mapping up in the tributary. So if the tributary areas are not really that important, you just want to include them in the mapping, this is an acceptable way to model that, that system. If, on the other hand, this tributary is important and you want to have um, want to model it with a sloped water service, you'll need to model it as a, se a secondary tributary. Okay. Question. Yeah. So that would look like none of them are overlapping So uh, your cross sections should never overlap. Should never, even on the contours. Okay. Correct. So. Another tricky si situation that you're going to run into are sinusoidal rivers. So you might have a river that bends. How do you lay out your cross sections around that bend? Well, we like to think of this bend kind of like a wheel where we have a spoke and then the cross sections are a spoke coming out of the wheel. And so you can visualize it. If water's in the main channel, it's perpendicular to flow. If it's out in the overbanks, it's perpendicular to flow. Um, so think, think about it as a, as a wheel with, with a spoke, with, with a hub with spokes. And uh, again, cross sections should never cross. Modeling junctions, how do I have cross sections uh, for junctions? Here we've got a, a river coming into another river. If we're trying to do a good job modeling and mapping this, we need to have some sort of <coughs> understanding of where high ground is between the two tributaries. For high flows, oftentimes our tributaries are gonna mix, right? And it's not really a 1D situation. Um, if that's the case, you can go get some aerial photography and you can typically see where the muddy water is coming into the clear water or vice versa. Um, but anyway, to lay out your cross sections, you're going to need to identify what we call the plane of confluence of the river. 
and then run your cross sections up and stop them at that plane. So this tributary will be modeled with this set of cross sections and this tributary will be modeled with this set. Now, how do we lay out those cross sections perpendicular flow? Well, we have some tools available to us in RAS Mapper um, where we're gonna be able to help visualize the floodplain. So we could lay out our cross sections like that but if we had a uh, visual guide on how to do that, it would help us identify that, oh, we're not doing that right. So the first thing we can do is we, we can lay out our bank stations. And if we had our bank stations laid out, you can quickly see where our cross sections are not perpendicular to the main channel bank, right? That's one good visualization. Another good visualization is we can do uh, flow path lines. So we can identify the main center mass of flow in the main channel and then in the overbanks, okay? And the main uh, flow path in the overbank is going to be dependent on the flow event that you're modeling. But if you're trying to model the 100-year the event, the 1% chance event, once you have an idea for where that floodplain is, you can get an idea for where the center mass of flow is gonna be. So once you have your flow path lines and your banks laid out, now you can start laying out cross sections to just make sure they're bent to follow those different flow paths. So now you can go in and you can make sure, okay, I'm perpendicular to flow in the main channel and I'm perpendicular to flow in the overbank. Okay, so that's a way to visualize how to lay out cross sections. Yeah? So to do your flow paths, would you be doing that from like aerial photography or? So the question is, how do I know where to lay out my flow paths? It's not something you're just gonna pick up, look at a train model and be like, oh, I know my flow path should go exactly right here. It, that, that's not something you're going to be able to intuit from your first look at a train model. You need to know how high the water surface is gonna be or how large the floodplain is gonna be for every part of the way of the floodplain. And how are you gonna know that if you've never looked at your river system before? You're just gonna be guessing, right? So what you're always, you're gonna find that when you do modeling, it's always, a, always an iterative approach. You're gonna start off with a crude model, not crude because you don't know what you're doing, but crude because you don't know what you're doing, right? So you have to put that crude model together, get it up and running, and then refine that model. So the first time you did this, maybe your flow path line came all the way in here. It was really tight. And then you saw, oh, this is a really big floodplain. Like, I, for this event, I get a lot of water out here in the floodplain. So then you can go through and you can edit those flow path lines and improve them and improve your cross sections and work towards a really good model, okay? So good question. All hydraulic modeling is an iterative process. You won't get it right the first time around. Okay, so up to this point, we've been talking about cross sections and where we lay them out and how we lay them out um, for the next part of the, the discussion, we want to talk about the different properties that we can define on the cross sections and how they affect the computations, okay? So the first thing we're gonna talk about are bank stations. So at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about RAS and three equations that you needed to always keep, keep uh, thinking about. What were they? Energy, Manning. Energy Manning. equation. Manning's equation, and then part of the energy equation was just the energy loss between cross sections, right? So at this point, we need to start thinking about Manning's equation. We start thinking about the different properties on a cross section. Manning's equation was developed for trapezoidal channels or for single channels. It wasn't a, an equation that was developed for complex channels. So when we're applying Manning's equation, we treat each cross section as three different flow regimes, three different uh, flow sections. We talk about the main channel, and then we talk about the left over bank and the right over bank. Okay, and actually when we go to do the math, we actually combine the left over bank with the right over bank, and then add it in with the channel. But in order to, to utilize Manning's equation, we need to identify where the channel is. So we identify that in RAS with what we call bank stations. So the bank stations are gonna define the main channel conveyance in the main channel, um, and it allows for a better flow distribution and computation of the average water surface in the cross section by doing so. 
So we need to think about that. So we're going to have our bank stations. We're also going to have these things called downstream reach links. And the downstream reach links are going to come from the layout of our flow path lines. Okay, so um, the downstream reach length in the main channel is computed via this line. In the left over bank, it'll be this line. And in the right over bank, it'll be this line. Notice those are all different, right? So if I want to have an average reach length between these two cross sections, what is that average reach length? Well, in RAS, we compute that average reach, reach length based on conveyance. This is really cool. It means these guys out here are not as important as you might think they are. If flow is only in the main channel, we're only going to use the main channel because that's the only place we have conveyance. If we have conveyance in the overbanks, but we only have 20% of flow out in the overbank, we're only going to use this line 20% of this to influence the length. Okay, so the reach length that we're going to use in this energy loss equation, this L, is going to be based on a conveyance weighted reach length between the cross sections. It's really important to understand that because if you get the overbank uh, reach lengths off by a little bit, it doesn't hurt you. If there's no flow out in the overbanks for the, for the low flow event, that's okay. We won't use those overbank reach lengths. Okay? As water creeps out there, we start to use more and more of that reach length in the, the length computation. Is that flow <coughs> going to be like the max extent of a certain profile, or are you trying to draw like the center line of the overbank? So typically we're going to evaluate the two year up to the 500 year event, right? Yeah. And so when we lay out those flow path lines, we want to have a flow path line that is representative of the larger events that are out in the overbank because for the smaller events, we don't care, right? It's the water, the flow path is gonna follow the main channel. So this overbank uh, location should be the center of mass of flow for a large event because that's when we actually wanna know that distance. So center mass, so like yeah. the center of it. Right, and so here I've got my picture of my center of mass of flow. If your overbank is steep, you're gonna have a more triangular shape. So your center of mass of flow should be about one third of the way out into the floodplain. Whereas if you have a nice wide flat floodplain, it'll be more rectangular, and then the center of mass of flow will be uh, more the center of that rectangle. Okay, and so then you're just going through cross section by cross section, trying to connect the dots as you work your way downstream. So that's where the, the L term comes in in the energy loss equation. The friction loss, the friction slope is computed from Manning's equation, and then it's going to be averaged between the two cross sections over which we're taking that friction. Okay, Mang's roughness coefficients, they're what are used for computing the friction losses from cross-section to cross-section. Factors that are affecting it include the roughness of the, of the bed itself, vegetation, irregularity, a more sinusoidal channel, there's more turbulence, more friction loss, uh, flow obstructions, and then scour and deposition. But Stan's gonna talk about them in detail tomorrow. So here's just some a moment of Zen where you can see some pretty pictures of some rivers and wish you were out there um, right now rather than in a classroom. So here's, a, here's an end value, a uh, relatively low end value, 0.032 for the arid southwest, um, where if water was up into the vegetation, what would that end value look like? Um, be about around 03. To get into a mountain stream, again, visualize the water surface about five or six feet higher, what would my end value be? It's more like an 055. Um, and you'll see some more examples of that uh, this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon. Getting back to the energy loss equation, uh, we talked about friction losses. Contraction expansion losses are taken as the absolute difference between the velocity heads between the cross sections. And RAS will figure out whether you should, whether flow is contracting or expanding based on the velocity. So if your downstream velocity, V1, is higher than the upstream velocity, V2, is that a contraction or expansion? You have water accelerating. 
Contraction or expansion? Contraction. Contraction, right? If velocity downstream is lower than the velocity upstream, it is expanding. And so based on figuring out uh, which the magnitude of velocities, we can figure out whether we should be applying a contraction or expansion coefficient. And then we have a table here of some general contraction expansion coefficients for subcritical flow. By default in RAS, all your cross-sections have a contraction coefficient of 0.1 and expansion coefficient of 0.3. Notice it says gradual transitions. Why is that our default in RAS? We want you to lay out your cross-sections to smoothly capture the changes from cross-section to cross-section. So your cross-sections should be laid out in gradual transition form. Okay. Uh, around bridges, you'll have a little bit higher contraction expansion loss. Um, so those are typical uh, values for that. Note, these are for subcritical. If you have a high velocity channel with supercritical flow, <coughs> then you're going to want to reduce those factors and reduce them by a lot. Um, otherwise, you can get too much losses um, in the energy equation. Okay, so that's a, the contraction expansion part. Okay, um, and then the last little bit is I want to introduce you to um, the properties that we have to control the computations on the cross section. The first one, as Stan alluded previously, are ineffective flow areas. So, ineffective flow areas are areas where we are going to deem a part of the cross section as non conveying. What's another word for non-conveying? It is storage, but in 1D flow we don't have storage per se. That's more an unsteady flow answer, but that is exactly correct. I want you guys to think non-conveying velocity equals zero. Okay, so that's that's what I want. So anytime you see uh, ineffective, I just want you to understand velocity equals zero. Velocity equals zero. Velocity equals zero. So the way we um, identify those is with ineffective flow areas, and we're essentially blocking out the cross section, saying any water that's out there, that's great. I can map it. I can do create a nice, pretty inundation map, but the water is not moving. It's not conveying in the downstream direction. So how are we going to do that? Well, in 1D, it's really hard. Well, not really hard, but it's more difficult. But if we have a nice plan view with a nice terrain model, and we've got cross sections laid out, we can easily start to understand how to block out different areas of the cross section where we don't want water conveying. So here you can see we're, we're expanding, but water can only expand so fast and then it's got to contract again. So you can see this shape of an expansion contraction. Same on the other side. And you can get crazy with um, laying out your cross sections too wide and needing to block them out, or maybe you just have a really wide floodplain and you need to follow a certain pattern. Okay, the other thing we have um, is what's called a blocked obstruction. Okay, for defining a blocked obstruction, and um, both ineffective areas and blocked obstructions, we can define the same way in RAS. The way you define them is you define them with a station and then an elevation. Okay. Uh, in effective areas, we're, we're blocking out where we don't want water to go, but we're saying we still want to map it there. Okay, it's still wet, just no velocity. A blocked obstruction removes area from the cross section, and it adds this wetted perimeter. So it, it, you're essentially modifying the cross section to no longer have the previous shape, but to have this new shape. Okay, so blocked obstruction adds wetted perimeter, whereas an ineffective flow area just removes conveyance from the cross section. Question, Parker. Does a levee do kind of the same thing, except it doesn't add a wetted perimeter? It just um, stops the HECRAS model from modeling water past that levee? Yeah, so levee, you're thinking of that picture. So a levee is very similar to a blocked obstruction. However, with a levee, so a levee does, it does add wet perimeter, but it has uh, uh, all of these 
options have an elevation associated with them. And the levy elevation, once the levy is overtopped, the levy goes away. Whereas with a blocked obstruction, when the water surface gets over the obstruction, the obstruction stays there. So you, in effect, in effect modified the cross section. So the cross section now looks like the top part. So levees are an old holdback. We prefer in one dimensional modeling that we don't use the levee option anymore. If you ever really need to use the levee option, then we have other ways that we think you should do, do your modeling. Um, truncate your cross section, use a lateral structure and then attach that lateral structure to either a storage area or a 2D area or something else. So you are correct that when a levy gets overtopped in the real world, the levy is still there. However, it's not really removing much conveyance from the cross section. Um, it would be adding wetted perimeter. So, and, and that's, that's the problem with um, using the levy option in RAS is we don't have a way to model two different water surfaces on either side. The way the levy option works is the levy excludes water from part of the cross section until the water surface reaches a certain level. And then the levy goes away and now the whole cross section is flowing full. And there's no, oh, my water surface dropped and the levee's still here and now I shouldn't have water over here. So if we were doing it, one, use it in that fashion, we would need to use the levy option in accordance with some ineffective flow areas to block out area um, it's too complicated to do in one dimension properly. Right. So that's why we would, the levy option is not supported in RAS Mapper because we want people to use a different option. But we want you to be aware of the options that are available. Okay, and I saw we had a whole bunch of questions. Lindsay. Uh, the flood wall is like, how would that be? That would be a blocked obstruction? A flood wall is essentially the levy option. Um, it's just a uh, flood wall and a levee are the same. They're just built a little bit differently. Um, and so, yes, you guys will have this week lots of like, I've been asked <coughs> to work on this river model and it's got a flood wall. How should I model it? And then we could talk about that. Um, but the levee option, the way the levee option works, there's no water there. And then when, do I, no, I don't have another picture. When the water surface gets to a certain level, the levy goes away. Well, we know that's not how things would work in real life, right? Um, and so that's probably not the best option. Okay. Um, if a block obstruction is overtopped, the side outside the channel, is that effective flow still? For a blocked obstruction? So like if a blocked obstruction was like... Like, like that? that? <laughs> yeah, like that. Okay. So in this case, this is uh, another way we can add uh, blocked obstructions where we have what we call multiple blocks. You can do multiple block, uh, multiple ineffective areas the same way. For a blocked obstruction, again, we're just modifying the shape of the cross section. It's removing area and it's adding wetted perimeter. Okay, so in this case, we brought in Walmart and they built a pad next to the river and there's a nice flat landing pad. Here, maybe a bridge got washed out and the piers remained. Um, those piers are removing conveyance from the cross section, but they are adding wetted perimeter to the calculation. Fatima? Uh, I was say, are, are block obstructions what cause the roof building to rain? That is one way you could model. You could use that option to model buildings and houses. Okay. Yes. Especially in steady flow, that would be appropriate. In unsteady flow, we like to use increased end values because most buildings, water can get into them. Okay. And so we like to show, A, that we like to show that they're wet, but B, water can seep into the buildings um, slowly. So depending on how big the building was. If it's a warehouse, you, wanna, uh, you want to include that volume in your, your, cal your calculations, but yes. For steady flow, blocked obstructions are a great option for removing part of the floodplain. Chris? So the blocked obstructions, they don't have properties? Like I wouldn't be able to put an end value? The no, the, for blocked obstructions, they use whatever end value is provided in the cross section. So if you, wanna, if you want to change the end value for that, then you can go in and you can put in an additional <coughs> end value. 
Good questions. Are we all questioned out? We have more. Okay. Um, so we talked about levies, where levies can either be a type totally hypothetical or they can be a embedded in the terrain where you just don't want water to go out into the overbank option. Um, okay, and then the last thing are junctions. Anytime you have a junction, you need to identify uh, the distance for us to, we're still gonna do um, the energy. We're still gonna do computations from cross section to cross section across the junction using the energy equation. You'll need to specify the distance. So the way you read this is from main river lower, which this is downstream, but whatever, main river downstream uh, to main river upper. So to main river upstream, that's this distance of 275. And then this is the distance from main river to the tributary is 300. And so that's the way you read it. I always like to point that out because as a relatively experienced RAS user, I sometimes have to read the text in the in the uh, editor just to make sure I put in the correct data. Anita? So it's from cross-section to cross-section, not yes. from junction to cross-section? Correct. Um, any other questions? All right.